Good stories need structure. I talk a lot about writing on this channel with rewrites and story pitches, but rarely do I ever get into what makes a story work. So today I wanted to break down one of my favorite movies of all time, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, to ask one very important question. How do you tell a story? By the way, I did laundry. <laughs> We're doing Spider-Verse today because, well, firstly, it won the community poll, but also because it's a movie that does a lot in a really short amount of time while never feeling rushed or poorly paced. And it's a good example to use when talking about story structure. This, of course, is just my process to how I break down story. You can go about it any different way you want. I like to structure my stories using a bunch of different ideologies, most famously Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey, which for those who don't know, basically this guy went through like eons and eons of mythology and poetry and plays, and he broke things down into beats to help determine what we as humans like to hear when it comes to stories. It's a fascinating concept. It's a little too restrictive at times. Like there's weird things about like a mentor and a temptress and like things that are like really specific that don't work for every story. But there are a lot of key elements there that are super important and can be applied to a lot of different stories. Now this isn't to say that all stories are told like this or that they have to follow into the structure rigidly. The entire point of art is that these rules are made to be broken. But I think it's a good idea to try and understand the rules as best as you can so that if you do break them, you can understand why you're breaking them. The basics of story structure, at least when writing for film, is to split the story into three acts. You can think of this as beginning, middle, and end. The first section of act one is what I would call the opening imagery or the cold open. To me, a great movie sets up its ideas and its themes within its first few minutes. Horror movies like to use this opportunity to introduce the villain and let the audience know what kind of movie they're in for, like is the case with one of my favorite films, Scream. God, I want to talk about Scream. I love Scream. You guys don't know. I... In the case of Spider-Verse, the movie begins by lying about the theme. We're introduced to Peter Parker as Spider-Man who very deliberately says, there's only one Spider-Man and you're looking at him. Before we're immediately introduced to Miles Morales proving that statement wrong. Despite saying the opposite, the theme of this movie that anyone can wear the mask is made clear to the audience from the get-go and as all good movies should, everything else in the film exists to reinforce that concept. From here we get to the next section which I'd call normalcy. This introduces us to the world of the movie and our main protagonist as well as their big driving desire of the film. What do they want? In Miles's case, we meet him and his family and his new life at this new school, and we learn that he wants to be more like his uncle Aaron. He wants so bad to go back to his old school and ignore the opportunities that he's been granted, and this is shown both in his conversation with his father and in his time that he spends with his uncle. The next section is our call to action, and this is traditionally where the story really begins. It doesn't have to be a literal call to action where somebody is asking for somebody's help or anything, but the character is presented with the opportunity to abandon the normalcy and embark on some kind of life-changing quest or adventure. Again, it doesn't have to be a literal adventure or a literal quest. A lot of times, the fear of leaving the safety of the normal leads to an initial refusal from the protagonist. This doesn't always happen, but it usually does, even just for like a little bit. For Miles, the call to action doesn't come from a somebody, but a something when he's bitten by the genetically engineered spider and starts to develop various spider-related powers. I think I hit puberty. In this case, the adventure that he's being called to is the idea of Miles leaving that normal and becoming a new Spider-Man. He then refuses this, saying, It's not possible. It's, it's, it's a normal spider and I'm, I'm a normal kid. <laughs> but the movie still has to happen. So the character reevaluates their refusal and begins the journey either by choice or they're forced into it. In Spider-Verse, Miles goes to investigate the spider that bit him and encounters Spider-Man in the middle of a fight. Spider-Man is killed by the Kingpin and Miles feels it's his responsibility to take the mantle and finish the job. You could argue that this is the call to action and then there's a refusal here with his parents. Again, this is all subjective. It, 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 you know? And here we begin Act 2, which is the longest act and where the majority of our plot events take place. I like to split Act 2 into two sections, which I'd call Act 2A and Act 2B, splitting it right at the midpoint of the film, which I'll get into later. We can begin this part of the story by introducing the protagonist to new companions and allies, such as, in Spider-Verse, Peter B. Parker. You have money, right? I'm not very liquid right now. Oh yeah, that reminds me. This video is brought to you by Exter, the world's slimmest and smartest wallet. Bifold wallets end up becoming super thick and massive. I've been forced to downsize what I walk around with to keep mine slim enough to fit in my front pocket, because we all know that sitting on a wallet all day can really hurt your back. Oh, my back! I've been using Extra's Parliament wallet, and I'm loving how sleek this thing is while still being able to carry around everything I would ever need. I've never really been into money clips or card holders because I always felt like I was missing out on something, but this is a great middle ground that I'm really impressed with. And it gives me super fast and easy access to my monkey card. Plus, if you still want the traditional style, Extra also offers a bifold variation that's sleek and modular without adding any extra bulk. 
On top of that, they offer this really cool like tracking card to help you keep track of your wallet. It has a ringing feature and separation alerts to make sure you never lose it. Right now, they're having their summer sale until August 23rd and use my link down in the description to get 20% off your order site-wide. And thanks to Extra for sponsoring this video. The first half of Act 2 has what I call the first trial. The characters will usually have a smaller situation to deal with that's not as grand in scale as the second half of the film. For this movie, this is the whole thing about fixing the goober and breaking into Alchemax to seal the computer. All right, let me tell you the good news. We don't need the monitor. Oh. That brings us to the midpoint of the story. The midpoint should rest at, well, the middle. It doesn't have to be the exact midpoint, like down to the minute, but roughly around there is good if you want to get the pacing right. This is where the story shifts from just leaving the normal into something bigger. We start the movie by looking for the Ark of the Covenant and change into trying to get the Ark back from the enemy. The dinosaurs break out, turning Jurassic Park from a fun theme park into a living nightmare. In the case of Spider-Verse, I think that that moment is where the audience is formally introduced to Gwen Stacy as Spider-Woman. Gwen represents a big shift in the narrative by being the first of these new characters from the other dimensions to come through and into the story, changing from just Miles and Peter B into this whole cast of Spider-People. Technically, it's a few minutes after the exact midpoint. The real midpoint is selecting a bagel. Again, this is all subjective. It's it's just down to how you interpret the story and what you think is an important moment. In the second half of Act 2, we have what I'd call the rock bottom. Usually this is where our characters are at the lowest, sometimes literally. That was a joke. That was a reference to my other videos. Or at the very least, the threat is bigger than ever, and the protagonist has to introspect a little to figure out what they have to do. In Spider-Verse's case, it's the death of Uncle Aaron. We've set this character up to be important to Miles, representing all the things that he initially thought he wanted in life, and his death is the low point in the story for him, further motivating him throughout the final act. But this motivation doesn't come from nothing. Something has to be the driving force that kicks the protagonist from their low point into doing something about the situation. Often this comes with a motivational speech or some other kind of breakthrough, culminating in this big triumphant moment where the hero returns stronger than ever. For Miles, after Aaron's death and after being benched by the other spider people, his father comes to his dorm and talks to him through the door, and it's these words that inspire him and push him to break out of his restraints and finally step up as a hero in his own way, making his own suit and taking that leap of faith to truly become Spider-Man. It's a really good scene. And now we begin Act 3, the big finale of our story where the stakes are at their highest and the protagonist faces the antagonist once and for all. Superhero movies have gotten a lot of flack for having the same formula, quote unquote, and I think a lot of that comes from third acts having a lot of the same similar elements. With similarly stale CGI battles and similarly stale CGI villains, I don't like that sentence, I don't like saying so many S's in a row, that staleness doesn't come from the story structure, it comes from specific ideas becoming stale. So many S's! What what am I doing here? There's a reason that most movies have stopped doing big sky beams because people have caught on and got tired of it. In Spider-Verse, this is of course our set piece in the Collider. The first half of the battle is the other spider people trying to get home to their dimensions with Miles making his grand entrance. And the second half of the battle is what I call the final stretch. The protagonist faces against the antagonist and is seemingly losing before the hero has one last final stretch to defeat the villain in a way that only the protagonist can. This is where we show the true growth of the character or at least where the character makes the biggest realization about themselves, learning what they initially wanted wasn't what they needed. This is why whenever an anime protagonist thinks about their friends, the villain's gonna get their shit rocked. With the other spider people gone home, Miles faces off against Kingpin on his own. Fisk is beating the crap out of him before Miles eventually stands up and gives the famous Hey. <laughs> So the antagonist is defeated and the day is saved and the protagonist leaves the situation and leaves the journey with a new understanding of themselves and their purpose leading to a new normal. For Miles, it's embracing this identity of Spider-Man and his newfound relationship with his father. From that is the final imagery of the movie. I always love it when the closing imagery parallels the opening imagery, at least in spirit, you know, symmetry. It's like poetry, so if they rhyme. And the ending imagery of Spider-Verse is the most obvious with it. Not only is there a lot of similar visuals with the way Miles swings around and the way Peter swings around, but it directly contrasts the idea presented at the opening of the film, with Miles presenting the idea that anyone can wear the mask. You know, the theme of the movie. I go on this whole tirade about story structure not because you have to follow these rules or because you don't want to ruin movies for anyone. Sure, when you have a stronger understanding of art, you can see more clearly where things fail. When you have that understanding, you can start to even further appreciate the craft, both when it follows the standard principles and when it follows these guidelines, but also when it knowingly attempts to subvert them, because there's a big difference between breaking a rule accidentally and breaking a rule intentionally. Breaking down Spider-Verse, one of my favorite movies of all time, into the story structure makes me appreciate it even more. That's not to mention the more nuanced layers of the script that I didn't even get into. Understanding how story works is no different from understanding how a camera works or how a paintbrush works. So if you're a writer or even if you just love storytelling, I encourage you to take your favorite movie or book or story and dissect the narrative into this format. I think there's a lot you can learn from it and it might make you love that thing just a little bit more. Thanks so much for watching everybody, I know this was kind of
of a bit of a different video. So if you like this video, be sure to like button and subscribe. And let me know down in the comments of other movies that you'd like me to do a similar story breakdown for. Special thanks to Alto the Sting, Cassidy Bond, Chicken McDoofus, Cole Soup, Damp Towels, Iron Ninja, Jonah, Corey's Not Fresh, Lime Spice XL, Logan Triplet Films, Ryder Harrison, DRC Partsy Guy, Tim Newfeld, Tyler Goodrich, Wyatt Wilson, Yobi Perkins, Zachary Stonebreaker, Zero to Hero 148, and ZC Tosi for being spectacular fanboys on my Patreon. It's been Troy Boy 17 coming at you live. There's nothing political about saying people deserve human rights, and I'll see you guys around.